So I had to rewrite my script for this after some information came out after I wrote it and recorded everything. Black Myth Lukon was the hit no one saw coming. When I saw it announced, I knew I wanted to play it. Due to my passing familiarity with the Monkey King, Sun Wukong. But the success it has achieved is just amazing in its own right. So what is Black Myth Wukong? In terms of story, it takes place after the events of the Journey to the West. And Sun Wukong being confronted by the Celestial Court. And while battling Erlong Shen, the headband that kept him in check reappears on his head allowing him to be struck and encased in stone. Over time, aspects of Soon were taken and found by characters that Soon interacted with in the Journey to the West, in the form of relics. Here, the main protagonist, a monkey called the Destined One, sets out to find all the relics to revive Soon Wukong. One bug, and the only real bug I encountered or noticed, was during the cutscenes. The audio and the video would not sync up. I had to change my bit rate of my audio device and that fixed the issue. But if I had any other program open during the cutscenes, the audio would not sync up again. Safe to say my recording software did that, so I won't be playing any audio from the cutscenes. The overall animation of the game is gorgeous. There are a lot of details in the surrounding scenery and to the Yagwai. The environments are vivid with ambient noise and Chinese instrumental music playing in the background. It has an excellent sound design. The hits with the staff have a satisfying thumping sound, especially when you land a heavy attack. And the voice acting in Chinese is better than the English counterpart, although there are a few standout performances here and there. The overall level design ranges from linear to semi-open world, particularly in chapters 3 and 6. They have winding paths and a great deal of detail everywhere, with materials for crafting medicines and upgrades for the Destined One hidden in nooks and crannies. In some cases, they did too good of a job, because I tried to explore parts of the map thinking I could just to find an invisible wall. Now, some people complain about this, and I kind of get it, but considering the large number of open world games, it's no surprise that people did not like this. It's nothing new to game design either, and they chose to use them instead of filling up the view with a impossibly high valley wall or a sudden drop off a cliff. The one area that I guess would probably be sort of on the negative side is chapter six. Yes, it's open world and you get to explore it using the somersault cloud, but it's extremely empty outside of a few enemies here and there and bosses that you have to fight in order to progress to the game. But otherwise it's very empty. It's beautiful, but it's empty. In terms of gameplay, the best way to describe it is a bit of a mix of several game genres. Most notable, it has Souls-like elements combined with God of War, with a touch of Mega Man in there. It feels like they wanted the difficulty of Dark Souls games with the fast action of God of War. Game Science definitely managed to make a difficult game at times as a result. The difficulty in the game comes from the boss's attacks being flashy, to the point it Looks like I'm watching an anime with several attacks that are so fast that you will miss them if you blink or don't recognize the attack pattern or the telegraphs of the attack. In other cases, their telegraphs are a bit under animated when it comes to the combat. There will be occasional special attacks that if you don't dodge, the, the boss will enter a short cutscene and land multiple hits that cannot be stopped or negated and they are indistinguishable from regular attacks for the most part. Also, the bosses have a huge wind-up that it can be difficult to tell when you need to dodge or negate damage, and I overcame this with enough practice. I was able to overcome each boss by learning their attack patterns, although some bosses were easy enough to beat on the first try, while others took a few hours. 
As far as combat, it's fairly simple, with light attacks being the primary form of attack and dodging to negate damage. With both actions, you build focus, which can be used to enhance your heavy attack, perform special attacks, mid-combo, or to counter. Unfortunately, due to a bad translation, I never knew about the counter or even realized I did it a few times. I mainly stuck to the light combo and used that to build up focus points for my heavy attacks, which leads me to one more aspect of the game being a bit over animated. And it's far from the only game that does this. For some reason, the Destined One has a wind up of his own when it comes to the heavy attacks, and it can be easily interrupted with the lightest of attacks, consuming the focus points. So timing can be crucial when using the heavy attacks in any fight. In conjunction with the physical attacks, the Destined One has spells and transformations he can use. And most of these spells are actually directly from the mythology themselves, the ability to stop enemies or to create temporary duplicates of the Destined Ones, in which case that's what Wukong did using his hair. The transformations come from defeating enemies throughout the world and taking their weapons, thus transforming into them. Now, the Destined One can only transform into them for a short bit. If they run out of health or run out of might, they transform back into their monkey form. Most of the time, I just save these for bosses and rarely use it outside of that. But they can definitely pack a punch. Unfortunately, the most use I got out of one, I am not going to because I would give spoilers to the game, so I won't show that footage. Then there's the Gorg. It is used to replenish health and has only a few charges, but can be increased as you progress through the game and find materials needed to do so. It also has an animation that can be disrupted, but the charges won't be consumed at least. And there is a gourd that can negate some of the attacks that would disrupt the animation. I did have one problem with the gourd. Several times I would hit the button to drink, and even when all I was doing was walking, the Destined One would not drink. It got to the point where I would just button mash the left shoulder button to make sure he would drink. It did not happen with any of the other actions. The one negative I would have is the camera. At times, it's too slow, even when you speed it up to track bosses around the arena. When you lock onto an enemy, the camera will, at times, follow the boss due to the attack, taking the Destined One out of frame completely, and you cannot see the attack in relation to your position, making it hard to dodge the attack. At other times, the boss can be so big that you cannot see all of them, and they will attack with an attack going out of frame, making it hard to tell what is happening and making dodging harder. There were times that I was just frustrated that game science did not make the camera pan out to give the player a better field of view in such cases. The last issue I had is if you get backed into a corner with a wall, the camera will get smushed against the Destined One's back, making it impossible to see instead of panning out and making the terrain transparent. Some of these issues are not new to gaming. Bayonetta 2 comes to mind when it comes to the camera being too close. Stellar Blade was also over animated when it came to the enemy attacks and healing. Part of what frustrates me is there are older games like God of War 2, not the soft reboot sequel for clarification, pan the camera out when you fought large bosses. When it comes to weapons, the Destined One primarily uses a staff, but there are two spear options as well, and new weapons can be crafted as you progress through the game, boosting attacks or other abilities. You can eventually get Rui Jingu Bong, Sun Wukong's weapon. The same goes for armor. As you progress, you get access to materials to craft new armor that boosts stats and effects. And during New Game Plus, you can upgrade some of the armor. And I did see one video with an overpowered build, and it was just clickbait. I should add that each relic also adds a perk. You can choose one from three different perks. But if you go through New Game Plus, you retain the perk, so you can choose another. And there is a six relic you get as well when you start a New Game Plus. If you play through three times, you can get all the perks. I think four, 
to max out the six, but that might be because I missed the secret boss on my first playthrough. There are some light RPG elements to the game, where you can earn XP and will, the currency in the game, from killing Yagwai and bosses. With enough XP, you will get a spark to upgrade some aspect of the Destined One, like his combat abilities, stances, spells, transformations, and stats, like attack or defense as an example. This can get a bit grindy to max out all the stats, but New Game Plus playthroughs are encouraged as a result. I will admit the game is difficult at times, and I found myself getting frustrated and then angry at times, but after pure rage and stubbornness got me through the boss, I would have a wave of relief and happiness pass over me. There are times when the bosses change direction midair or move without doing any movement animation, which is more of a pet peeve of mine. With one exception that has me feeling a bit bitter. The hunted eyed Taoist. On top of being tall, he's also long, and his hitboxes are very small, with a giant gap between his two front legs that do not count if you hit him there, and the targeting forces you to attack the front and ignore the whole body because of how he's rotating, leading to multiple misses even when I can see the staff clipping through the boss. His wind-up for attacks take forever, and it feels like they time them just right. If you dodge too soon, you would not have a chance to dodge right after, and I would get nailed. After he's down to a third of his health, he will sort of roll while simultaneously slide across the arena to attack. He then swallows his sword, forming an aura that makes the Destined One slow and shrinks his stamina bar, making it hard to dodge the string of attacks that he bombards you with. I barely beat him, using all the charges in my gourd and a pill to fill my health bar, along with other stat boosting potions. The worst part is, he was a barrier to getting better equipment, so it's not like I could come back with a better weapon. For you completionists out there, it can take some time to get everything. Several of the achievements are tied to each other. Some parts can be missed, requiring you to start a new playthrough or a new game plus to get the items or transformations. Then there are a few items tied to gathering plants, the steel ginseng and the goat skull. I had to actively farm ginseng plants in chapter three and licorice plants in chapter two, respectively, to get their items. And maybe I was just having bad luck but it took hours to get those last two items. If you want all the achievements, prepare to do some grinding. I enjoyed the game overall, even with a few frustrating parts. The game looks and sounds amazing, but the combat could use some work. I felt that dodging was a bit too prominent in order to avoid damage, and I kind of wondered why there was no option to block or maybe just slow it down a bit. The use of Chinese mythology was refreshing, leading to some interesting encounters with various Yagwai. I'm not going to pretend to analyze the story, but I would say you get to see the aftermath of Sun Wukong's journey, and how even after he's gone, he still affects characters he came in contact with. As for the success of the game, that is an already foregone conclusion. It sold 10 million copies in 3 days, and then 18 million copies in three weeks, which is massive. They already have plans for DLC at this point, with the cost of producing the game being reportedly around $70 million. I kind of have to wonder if this will have some impact on gaming as a whole. Will other companies follow suit and we see more linear games in the future? Or maybe some companies moving operations to China in an attempt to reduce costs, similar to manufacturing in the West. Then there is the audience the game clearly demonstrates is out there, and how will that affect the content of games in the future. I don't want to speculate, but time will tell. If you made it this far into the video, thanks for watching.